All right, so this evening, um, we're going to be talking about theological anthropology and why it matters, particularly for bioethics. So here's, here's where we're going to go. There is um, many of the issues, not all, but many of the issues that arise in bioethics, and particularly some of the most perplexing ones, you know, the sort of mind-bending ones. They're, the, they're what happens when science fiction becomes science fact, or threatened to become science fact. And it looks like what we thought of, the previous generation thought of as science fiction, looks like it really could be science fact. And, and this, we need programs like this, and we have this program, partly because uh, some of the age-old issues don't go away, but also because there are new iterations, there are new versions, there are new issues that are coming up. And some, most of these are at the intersection of what we can do in science and technology, right? The intersection of that and deeply held uh, human values and particularly deeply held Christian values. That's where, the, that's where these things come up. That's where the issues come up. And sometimes in the past, Christians and people, in, um, people of Christian faith and people in the natural sciences and, and especially in technology, they've had an antagonistic adversarial relation. I mean, it's been going on for, for well over 100 years now. It hasn't always been that way. But for over 100 years, it's been this myth of conflict. And I just tipped my hand because I said myth. <laughs> but it is. It's a deeply seated myth. And it's not hard to find. In fact, it's depressingly easy to find. My um, wife is a um, middle school science teacher. And she does STEM, STEM education. This is really cool. She got invited last year. Well, she applied. And she was the only teacher from Wisconsin who got this, so this is cool. She got selected to go to NASA to space camp. Um, so then it was mandatory for our family, obligatory to watch First Man the day it opened. And so we're all sitting there. You know, usually we're like hoping that, you know, our kids don't make too much noise in a movie. This time I was like, come on. Because every like new scene, you know, of training, she's like, I did that, I did that. Did you hear me? I did that. Yeah, yeah, we heard you. We, we believe you, all right? Um, so, but we see this, but even at this level, right? So I went to one of her science and engineering fairs set up in the gym. Um, people have done these experiments and these kids. It's really cool. It's really fun. It's fun to encourage them. And some of it's pretty impressive what they're doing. But I've gone to these for several years. It's hard for me to walk through. She's in there and the other science teachers and their students have these exhibits. It's hard for me to walk through seventh grade science exhibits without there being some big setup, like some big placard set up or a video presentation the kids have made, without some demonstration of how religion has been really bad to science. I'm saying it's all the way down to you know our, our seventh graders. It's just sort of what they get with their lunch milk, the kind of hot, warm, cardboardy tasting lunch milk. It just sort of comes with the package. Well, there are reasons why we're in this situation. And sometimes, given this adversarial relation, some Christians want to withdraw from this sort of engagement. And I think that's really unhealthy and actually a disaster for the church. Other Christians want to jump on board and whatever the, and they want to sort of weaponize some finding of science and put it into action for their view, whatever that is. And so what we're going to look at tonight are a couple of case studies of what happens and how this can go wrong when you go either direction, okay? So, this I've mentioned this myth of essential conflict, and we should talk about that and where that comes from for a bit. John William Draper, in the 19th century, wrote a now famous or infamous book. You can't always tell a book by its cover, but in this case, you really can. The title of the book is The History of the Conflict Between Science and Religion. This is the narrative, as he says, of the conflict of two contending powers. In fact, that for him is the history of science. So what sets itself out to be and purports to be a, a textbook of the history of science is really a textbook of how science has tried to progress and religion has tried to squash it. And thankfully, you know, in the third quarter of the 19th century, enlightened people in the 1870s. Now we know science is winning. But this is a story of how this has gone. Andrew Dixon White, who's pictured here, 
was uh, early president of Cornell University. He actually managed to publish a big, fat, two-volume book called The History of the Warfare of Science with Theology. Hard to figure out what he's going to say, right? His thesis is that there is a conflict, as he says, between two epics in the evolution of human thought, the theological and the scientific. And the basic, the basic notion goes like this. Science progresses and progresses. As science gains ground, religion loses ground, right? It's a zero-sum game. There's just so much ground. Religion tries to explain everything. Science begins to explain more and more. Religion has to retreat. Religious leaders don't like losing their power, so they try to push back and squash the science. And they tell, I mean, this is hundreds and hundreds of pages of this. Unfortunately, um, it misled a lot of people. Fortunately today, there are a lot of historians who see this for what it is. Uh, some will call it things like this, a mixture of half-truths and outright fabrications. And there are, there are whole books written that are sort of settling the score now. Unfortunately, and it's 100 and something years too late, it's been in the textbooks for elementary students for, for a long time. It takes a while, but there's a, there's a, if you're interested in this, there's a fine book uh, that came out a couple of years ago called Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths. It's edited by Ronald Numbers. It's a Harvard University Press book. It's not published by a Christian press. It's not written by Christian authors. It's just historians of science who say, this is nuts, right? Let's try to set the story, story straight. And so these older myths like medieval Christianity was opposed to science or there was a flat, you know, everyone believed in a flat earth. That's, that's nonsense. No one did. Um, that Galileo was imprisoned and tortured by the Inquisition because he believed that the, uh, in a heliocentric universe. Now, that's not true either. Um, apparently, he was under house arrest, which is a bad thing, right? The church did, doesn't get a pass on that. Uh, but he wasn't tortured by the Inquisition. But the deeper problem with that sort of myth that has risen about this, the deeper problem is this. It wasn't an issue of science versus faith in the first instance. I mean, that did come into play, but it was mostly science versus science. Where Galileo is jumping on the Copernican bandwagon and saying, see, here we've got new science that shows that uh, we should be heliocentric rather than geocentric. And the Roman Catholic Church says, no, no, no. Established mainstream science tells us that the earth is at the center. We're not going to start endorsing these newfangled crazy notions. But you see that it's not theology versus science or faith versus science as much as it is science versus science. Old bad science that the church held on to as opposed to the newer science, which we now know is true, right? Well, but that's a very different, that's a very different account. So these sort of stories um, are, are half-truths in many cases, and sometimes they're just outright fabrications. Here's one that we all know quite well. I don't know if you can see that. The, I just picked this one at random. I mean, you can find literally dozens of these still around. These are headlines from 1925 from the Scopes Monkey Trial that was held in Dayton, Tennessee. This was immortalized in a couple of films that went under the name Inherit the Wind. The most recent one was actually made not that long ago, because I remember it. Uh, Jack Lemmon starred in it. Grumpy old man, dude. Um, oops, dated myself again. Um, but he, uh, he started in this, and the, sto the story as told in the popular press and the story as made famous in these movies goes something like this. There's this poor, honest, courageous school teacher. His name is John Scopes who's teaching in this backwards, hick, redneck school in Tennessee. And he teaches the sober truth, this Darwin's theory of evolution. And he gets persecuted for it by these rabid, fundamentalist, nasty people. And the good heroes, including the newspaper editor H.L. Mencken and America's leading lawyer Clarence Darrow, they come riding in to help him and fight for the truth. Meanwhile, 
the nasty fundamentalists go get their champion, William Jennings Bryan. He comes in and gets shown up. Again, obviously, there's a core of truth to that, right? There is a place there. It's, there's actually a college there now named Bryan College after William Jennings Bryan. The, the truth, though, is this, that John Scopes was actually a substitute teacher who agreed to this. He knew that this was going to cause an issue, and he said, look, I'll make myself sort of the guinea pig, and people are going to help pay my fees if I get fined or, you know, this kind of thing. I'm a substitute teacher. It's not a big deal. He agreed to it beforehand. It was set up. It was set up so that they could actually have this sort of national conversation, which, as you can see, really went national. I mean, if the Des Moines Register, right, a newspaper in Iowa, is making this front page when it comes out, this is a big deal. It was meant to be a big national story. It became a big national story. That much is true. But it wasn't a fight against the, the progressive left versus these nasty fundamentalist conservatives. That's the way it's portrayed. That's not really the way it went down. It is true that Clarence Darrow came to town. You can see him looking really happy and pleasant. Um, he, he did come to town, and he was America's sort of leading lawyer at the time, leading trial lawyer. Interestingly, it's a debate about, purportedly a debate about science and the interpretation of the Bible. He was neither a biblical scholar nor a scientist. The other side brought in William Jennings Bryan, who, oddly enough, for a debate about, for a court trial about, and a larger public debate about science and theology, on the one hand, uh, science on the one hand, theology on the other, was neither a biblical scholar nor a scientist. He was a politician. He was apparently a really skilled debater. He had run for president. Uh, he died shortly after this, just a few days after this. He, he didn't make it long. Well, William Jennings Bryan is often understood to be this hardbound sort of conservative literalist who believes six 24-hour days and the Bible and everything rises or falls on this happening in six 24-hour periods about six or 7,000 years ago. And he stands on that hill and he dies on that hill, almost literally. Clarence Darrow, this brilliant lawyer, uh, makes him look like an like an utter fool and embarrasses him. And even though they technically win the court case, they lose the court of public opinion and there it all goes. Well, there is some, some truth to that. They did have a trial. Neither one was actually qualified to talk about this stuff. Both of them are out of their lane. Both of them look kind of silly from a distance now, retrospectively. And in fact, you wonder, why did they even do this, right? Why did they agree to this? Well, it's pretty clear why Darrow agreed to it. And it's really clear why William Jennings Bryan agreed to it, right? If he wasn't hung up on the Bible teaching six literal days, 6,000, 7,000 years ago, why would he do this? Was he just grandstanding? Nope and nope. He did this because he was a progressive. He was a social gospel liberal Christian. You know, he had been, not long before, President Woodrow Wilson's uh, Secretary of State. He resigned that post due to his outrage when he thought that Woodrow Wilson was pushing the U.S. into World War I. He was a pacifist. He was insistent that we should not be involved in, in wars. You know what else he was about? He was about a bunch of other progressive causes. You know what he was really worried about? Social Darwinism. He was worried about people who were claiming, well, Darwin's theory shows us that scientifically this is the way it works out in biology, and if it's true in biology, wow, it must be true in sociology and economics and right, all these other areas as well. William Jennings Bryan takes this case and gets all fired up about it precisely because he's really concerned about what he sees as the social consequences of this. And in his mind, the way you deal with this, you know, you cut the head off the snake. You stop it now. You see the difference, though? He's often portrayed to be the enemy of science. What he's really concerned about are the social and ethical issues. As we'll see in a little bit, 
some of these uh, issues are actually not just broadly ethical issues, but they're actually bioethical issues. Clarence Darrow, for his part, uh, again, pleasant Clarence Darrow, um, had just, just before, had valorized um, determinism. Hey, let me tell you about one of his court cases. This is not long before. He had just defended two notorious rapists and killers on the grounds that, quote, every human life is the product of endless heredity back of him and the infinite environment around him. So William Jennings Bryan is like, I'm really concerned that this sort of loss of moral responsibility is going to take over. He's also really concerned with Christian values of love and justice. He's very concerned that we not uh, valorize issues of violence, uh, violence and hatred. He's really concerned for the poor and the weak and the most vulnerable among us. He's concerned that they be protected. And he sees this rising tide of Darwinism. Social Darwinism is really his main target. But he sees this rising tide of Darwinism as a threat to the people who are most vulnerable. And he sees Darrow leading the charge on that. He steps in and says, we're going to stop it here. Now, in retrospect, I think a lot of us think it's really unfortunate that the whole thing went down the way it did. You know, why did, if that's the issue, why don't you debate that issue and not bring up, uh, interpret, and not have two people, neither one of whom knows the science and neither one of whom knows the scripture that well, why are they debating science and scripture when that's the real issue? Okay. William Jennings Bryan was not anti-science. Um, he wasn't a, he was actually, if anything, he was a classical liberal and he wanted to usher in the kingdom of God through more um, s social policy. He saw Darwinism as a massive threat to this end and he resisted it accordingly. William Jennings uh, Bryan was one who, who, who championed those, the cause of uh, the poor and the oppressed and saw social Darwinism as the big threat to that. Very different than the story goes. All right, turning this more toward our issue, this is background, turning it more toward our issue, let's think of how evangelical responses to Darwinism uh, played out and then were employed. Here is an example. All right, the, the figure on the, with the big beard, the figure with the good beard these days, right? Um, the almost orthodox level beard, is R.L. Dabney. He is a Presbyterian, uh, famous Presby Southern Presbyterian minister, uh, church leader, theologian. Uh, we have uh, his books in our library to this day. He wrote big volumes of systematic theology. He is adamantly opposed to any kind of what he views as fatal compromise with the views of Darwin. And he insists that this that creation had to be 6,000 years ago in the space of six 24-hour periods, and you either, you either hold that or he says, surrender your Bibles. It, it all goes as a package. That's his view. Now, not all evangelicals at the time, not nearly all evangelical Christians at the time held a view like that. Uh, many of them were much more cautious. So um, on your handout, I've got a, the name Asa Mahan. He is uh, from Oberlin College, which was a leading center of thought at the time. Asa Mahan um, is also a bit hesitant at that point about, as you can see from the, even that little quote I gave you, he's a bit hesitant about endorsing Darwinism. But it's because he doesn't think the science is proven yet. Which, by the way, at that point, he had pretty good grounds to think that. But he says, I don't resist it. We don't resist it as Christians because of our theology. It's just because the science doesn't teach it, right? It's, it's unproven. It's a big question mark over it. But people like Dabney dig in the hills. It's 6,000 years, six, six 24-hour periods ago, 6,000 years ago. Or, or you surrender your Bibles, become an atheist. All right, that's it. 
There are Christians today who think the same thing, by the way, just so we know. But that's his view. Do any of you recognize the dude on your right? That's not an earlier picture of R.L. Dabney. Dude on the right is actually a really famous Civil War figure. It's not Grant, but thank you for playing anyway. They, but he does have a beard, like Grant. And he's also a really famous general, but you're on the wrong side so far. It's Thomas Stonewall Jackson, thank you. And if you're thinking, why did I throw them up on the same slide, there's a really good reason. R.L. Dabney, presumably with a less impressive beard at that time, was the chief of staff for Thomas Stonewall Jackson during the Civil War. He was a Presbyterian minister who entered the army, fought for the noble cause of the South and all that, and then after the war, went back to being a pastor and theologian. I, I put this up there not to sort of do weird way. They happen to live at the same time and do each other. Not even to sort of do a, a, a sloppy sort of, well, maybe they are some sort of guilt by association. No. I put, those, I put them side by side because they were actually close and because it's a, it's a matter of demonstrable fact that R.L. Dabney's resistance to any sort of Darwin, Darwinian thought is part and parcel of his Confederate views and particularly his racism. He's not the only one, by the way. This is rampant throughout North America, and not only the South, but particularly the South, um, in the period after the Civil War. The period of Reconstruction is especially bitter. And R.L. Dabney and others resist the new science of evolution precisely because it would threaten their superiority over other ethnicities. Uh, if you don't believe me, I'm happy to show you the original passages. I can also happily point you, there are multiple volumes written on this by reputable historians today. David Livingston has a book, uh, historian David Livingston has a book called Adam's Ancestors. It's well worth a read. It's fascinating stuff. He charts this in excruciating and really painful detail. Painful for those of us who are evangelical Christians. It, it's not pretty, but it's there. Dabney says, this is a quote, and you can see how, why, when I give you this quote, you'll see why he's so resistant to any notion, uh, any of Darwin's views. Because he wants to insist that these are not just different, anyway, he, what he wants to insist that there's nothing, nothing short of different species. Quote, the African, a different fixed species of the race separated from the white man by traits bodily, mental, and moral almost as rigid and permanent as those of genus. Hence the offspring, he says, must be an amalgamation, must be a hybrid race stamped with all the feebleness of the hybrid and incapable of the career of civilization and glory as an independent race. And this, he says, is the destiny which our conquerors have in view, if indeed they can mix the blood of the heroes of Manassas with his vile stream from the fins of Africa. Sorry, I'm embarrassed to actually quote it, but that's what it is. Maybe it's a bit antiquated. The heroes of Manassas, Manassas Junction, was, all, was also known as the Battle of Bull Run, and there were two, not one, but two major battlefields there, uh, battles fought there on that battlefield during the Civil War. I think 1861 or 1863, but I'm not positive about that, and it doesn't matter. The heroes of Manassas, his boys. And he's lost this, and he says, our conquerors now want to make us equal with these people from the quote-unquote vile fins of Africa. And he is 
adamant that you cannot allow this kind of new science to come in the door because it will, um, you can't allow it because it will somehow threaten our status as superior. So here we see innate, deep-seated opposition to new scientific movements that are based on this, this sort of view. There's more. You, this is a picture of Alexander Winchell. Alexander Winchell is a, uh, is a, was a famous geologist, very celebrated geologist. He was recruited by the Vanderbilt family when they started Vanderbilt University. Vanderbilt University was going to be this major center, you know, this elite new university funded by the big Vanderbilt money. The Vanderbilt, the big corporate magnets, the empire builders, the, the Vanderbilt family is giving back to society, building this massive new shiny university, and this cool new shiny university is going to, how do you, how do you, establish a good reputation. Well, you've got to throw a lot of money into a place and build nice buildings, but what do you have to have to have a good, fa a good university? You've got to get famous faculty. So one of their things, we're going to hire the best geologists in the world. So they go after Alexander Winchell. Alexander Winchell is a celebrated geologist who teaches at Vanderbilt, but then gets fired in 1878. Now, I mentioned earlier you remember those two books I talked about? The Warfare of Science and Christianity books, one written by the president of Cornell University? Those books look at Ale the story of Alexander Winchell as Exhibit A. See? Look what the church did. They ran out even the best geologist in North America, one of, the, one of the top, you know, right? They fired him because he was an evolutionist. These nasty Methodists who were controlling uh, Vanderbilt they couldn't handle the truth, and so they even ran off the, you know, one of the top geologists in the world. Again, you dig a little bit more deeply, and this isn't anything like it looks. It is true he got fired, and it is true that he taught Darwin's views, right? True and true. But if that's the truth, it's not nearly the whole truth, and it's not even the relevant truth. The more relevant truth is this. There's this big movement in the 19th century by geologists, particularly several from the South, Sammy Morton, George Glidden, Josiah Knott, to argue for what they call polygenism. That is, that um, different ethnicities stem from different sources. And then, of course, they come up with a hierarchy of which of those are superior, and I'm just going to let you guess. I'm going to take one look at his uh, skin pigmentation and let you guess which ones he thinks at the top. He sees this, he says, again, I quote, When the Negro departs from the white man, he approximates the African apes. These are different species that have evolved differently. They're not all human. They're not the same. They're not equal. They've evolved differently, and we're foolish to pretend that we're all one. And here's what he's doing. I've got the scientific support for my view. I can, you know, science is on my side. You see what's going on? Do you see why the Methodist at Vanderbilt might have been a little concerned about this? No, seriously. They look at this and hit the ceiling. They're like, if you're right, then none of these creatures are made in God's image. If you're right, Christ didn't die for any of them. And you realize that by that point, uh, that there were hundreds of thousands of, um, of Africans and African Americans now worshiping in Methodist churches, both the Methodist Episcopal churches, but also AME and AME Zion. 
That's not, it's just, it doesn't work. What They recognize this is what it is. This is an attempt to weaponize your science in a way to promote your racism. And they're like, we don't care how big a dude you are. Bye-bye, Winchell. But then that gets exploited back into the story of here's how the nasty religious people um, are so hard on the scientist. David Livingston, a historian, says to Winchell it was, quote, crystal clear that the black races, which he set out to establish as physically, psychically, and socially inferior to whites, were not descended from the biblical Adam, but predated him. Winchell says it is a matter of scientific fact, that's his phrase, that this is the case. You can see here a, a piece from his, one of his works, uh, maybe a little faint, sorry, but you can see here he's got these different, um, completely different races that have evolved separately. And these are all under the category of pre-Adamites. These predate the, the, they predate Adam, and they predate the pure race of Adam. And you can see there's, in the bottom is the Australian, upper left is, or up, go up one on the left is the Hottentot, the Negro, the, um, I can't read that, sorry. Moving over to the right side of the top, you've got Mon Mongoloid, Eskimo, and Papuan. These are distinct species that have all evolved separately and quote unquote, we got the science to, to prove it. This is from one of the books he wrote is called Atomites and Pre-Atomites. There are whole volumes, I'm telling you, there is a whole body of scientific literature that, that grows up in this time. He's not the only one, he's just one of the most famous. You see what's going on? There are people who are resisting science to support their racism overtly. And there are people who are endorsing, embracing, and then weaponizing this science to do so as well. This is depressing, I know. <laughs> but it, it should be. This isn't the whole story, and I, d I don't want to, um, to, to either move too quickly over it so we feel good about ourselves, nor to leave us in this place when there is more to the story. And there is more to the story. Here's a, a picture of B.B. Warfield. He is known as the, his nickname is the Lion of Old Princeton the champion of biblical authority and biblical truthfulness. And um, he's the one who, when the newer um, progressive modernism, modernist, quote unquote, modernist and liberal movements, and as well as social gospel movements come along, and they question or deny things like the virgin birth of Christ. He's the one that writes, you know, I'm going to write a treatise defending this. When they're trying to show that the Bible's riddled with errors and is basically a big pile of myths, he's the one showing that this is trustworthy and truthful. When people are uh, questioning the doctrine of the Trinity as either completely irrelevant or just super bad math, he's the one who steps in and writes essays with titles like The Biblical Doctrine of the Trinity. When people start questioning um, atonement, He's the one who stepped, you, you get the picture, right? He's the, he's the big champion, at least on the reform side of things, of his era. The big champion of evangelical Christianity. One might think that he would be, take a hard line on these things. It's actually not the case. He, he again, realized he's doing this about 100 years ago, just over 100 years ago. But he's at that point, he's saying evolution does not make it to proof. And he's, I think he's remarkably um, cautious on these things. He doesn't try to present himself as an expert in things he's not an expert in, which is always a good thing for Christians to do, by the way. It's just better to say I don't know than it is to make something up. But he does read the scientist. He does read biologists, and he does read paleontologists, and he really reads geologists. Geology is the big thing then. 
So he does read them. And he says, from what I can tell, Darwin's views don't make it to proof. There's just too many problems. There's too many questions. Remember, uh, those of you who are taking the science classes, remember these things. This is still before um, the Austrian monk Gregor Mendel actually discovers genetics. So there's a big piece of the Darwinian story that just is totally missing. So when, when Warfield says it's just not, you know, there's not good evidence yet, there's just not much proof, he means it. But, so he won't endorse it, but he does say uh, that, that it's, there's no necessary antagonism between Christianity and evolution. You may disagree, or I mean, we, you know, that's another issue. Uh, you may applaud that or be dismayed by that. That's his view. There's no necessary antagonism, he says, so far as we don't hold the too extreme a notion of evolution. So if you were to put him up and say someone like Richard Dawkins, you know, the famous Richard Dawkins today, of course he'd say that's too extreme a notion. But he says as long as you don't hold to too extreme a notion, there's no necessary antagonism. He says, now, some versions of evolution would require a great reconstruction of Christian doctrine and indeed a great lowering of the detailed authority of the Bible. In other words, he says there'd be a stiff price to pay, and for him it'd be too steep. But he says that's on some of the, some of the pr proposals. And then he says this, he says, if we condition the view, the theory, by allowing the constant oversight of God in the whole process, and his occasional supernatural interference for the production of new beginnings by an actual output of creative force that is producing something new, if we do that, he says, we can hold to the modified evolutionary theory and be Christians in the ordinary orthodox sense. He's not saying we should. In fact, he explicitly says, I say we may do this. Whether we ought to accept it, even in a modified form, is another matter. And he says, I purposely leave it an open question. I think he just thinks, you know, this is over 100 years ago. I think he's too early to tell. And let's not jump to conclusions. He's just saying, if it turns out to be true, it's not going to be a problem for Orthodox Christianity. Now, you might think, so what does that have to do with the big issue? Well, here's what he says about this. He says that we, he writes a, a treatise on the unity and antiquity of humanity. See those, those two parts, unity and antiquity. And he says sometimes these, he proceeds as, you know, like these get run together. And so, um, and the, the people who are doing the whole uh, pre-Adamite business, you know, they run these things together. So if it's old, right, if, if we have an ancient background, then we must not be unified. And he says, no, that's not true at all. And there, actually, there's no good reason to think that. And lots of good reasons to think otherwise. And he says, theologically, the question of the antiquity, like how long have humans been on the earth? He goes, theologically, that doesn't matter. Now, he does understand that some people are going to go, wait a second. If you count backwards from the genealogies, right, you start doing the genealogies of Scripture, and you count backwards, and then you go to the next one, you count backwards, you're going to get, you know, seven or 8,000 years, somewhere in there, six, 8,000 years. So it does matter, right? And he looks at that, and he looks at those genealogies in this essay, and he says, you know what? The same thing to conclude is that those, essay, that those genealogies are telling the truth, but they're not trying to tell the whole truth. It, they're not meant to be a full record of everybody who's ever lived. And we know this because if you compare the genealogies in the Bible, some of them have gaps that others fill in. Do you see that? I'm getting some blank stares. They're not trying to be uh, the full court record of everybody who's ever lived in your, in your background. They're telling the truth, but they're telling the truth we need to know. And it would distract us from the truth we need to know if it was every name. I mean, you think, think um, just as an aside, think of how Matthew's gospel opens, the part we always skip at Christmas. 
This is genealogy, right? Have you ever counted those names? There's 42. There's 42, and actually Matthew breaks them up for us when he says there are 14, and then 14, and then 14. You're like, okay, that's kind of pointless, right? No, not if you, and I'm not a big numerology guy, right? Don't, I don't, please don't get all weird on that stuff. But without going into the weird stuff, uh, sevens and threes are both important in Scripture. Numbers of completion, of arrival, of fulfillment, of telos, right? And so it's like, Matthew's like, hmm, do you ever happen to notice? Sevens, fulfillment, and we got three sets of double sevens, how's that? Now, if he counted every name in the genealogy, it wouldn't be that convenient for him. So he counts those, and then it builds to his conclusion so that when you actually get to the stuff we start reading about Christmas time, he's saying he's, the, he's, he's it, he's the fulfillment. This is the one. This is it. Do you see the theological point that's being made by the genealogy? It's to bring us to the climax. He's the one. If you had all the names in there, you'd actually lose the theological point. Now, all those names really are in there, but the, the genealogy is not trying to give us the full record. It's trying to make a theological point. And Warfield points this stuff out, and he's like, if, if we think the genealogies are meant to give us the full record, okay, then we got a problem. But they're not meant to do that, so don't read them that way. And if you don't, then the question of how long humanity's been on the earth just isn't an issue. So he says the antiquity doesn't matter, theologically. But the unity of the human race is of utmost importance. And he says the unity of the human race is something to which we must hold. And here's where, when he says unity of the human race, he doesn't mean the unity of white folk. And I'm not saying that he has... Um, I'm not saying we should idealize or certainly not idolize his own views of race and ethnicity all the way down, right? I'm not saying his views of racial, race relations were, were, were perfect. But he does say this much. And he says he's not talking about just white folks. He says this is human, humans are one, all in God's image, all of equal rights and value. He does it. And he's not alone. In fact, uh, uh, some of you have probably had classes with Dr. Gunlock, right? And he talks about Warfield. If you've had him, you've probably heard Warfield because I haven't even had that many conversations with him and I've heard Warfield's name a lot. Uh, but several decades before Warfield, by the way, he's really an expert at Warfield. It's, kind of, it's cool to hear him, you know, wind him up and get him going. And it's just fun to watch somebody geek out on something they're really good at. Uh, Dr. Gunlock's cool. But... Um, it's also cool to be able to point out to him that several decades before Warfield was doing this, a Methodist theologian, John Miley, takes an even stronger view, <laughs> or at least as strong, and is saying, in effect, the same things. And his language is antiquated, and his language is not the kind of thing we'd use now, but I hope you can see the basic point that's being made there. The basic point, uh, the major point of this, is that... Um, is that we should understand, understand it this way. And it's not just him. Uh, there are others, um, other major Methodist figures at the time who are holding similar views. William Burt Pope and others um, are, are emphatic about these things. All right, so that is, um, you see here, is an example of how appeals to the science get weaponized. I mean, thankfully, there are theologians like on the reform side, like Warfield, and again, I'm not trying to put a halo on, on him, but he's better on this. There are reform theologians like Warfield who don't play this game of weaponizing the science in support of the racism. And there are Methodists like John Miley and William Burt Pope and others who do similar moves. What is it that makes it different for them? I submit to you it's that they have a theological anthropology. If you don't, you're going to get blown by whatever winds are, are whipping hard. And when science tells you something, you're going to roll with it. 
And when people weaponize that science and put it in use of, of particular ideological and moral purposes, you're just going to go with it. It's not just on race issues. Let me mention a couple more as well, and here I'll move a little bit more quickly. One is the history of eugenics. And here's where, again, um, modern science grows and booms and uh, not only, but especially Darwin's theories take root and ta then flower into what's known as social Darwinism. And eugenics is the direct result of that and, and called that as such at the time. Social Darwinism, in effect, what Darwin's theories do in biology, social Darwinism said must also, what's true in biology, because Darwin you know, showed us this, what's true in biology must also be true in, um, in, so, in sociology and economics everywhere. And so this is, among other things, social Darwinism is, is pushed in support of like the most unbridled kinds of capitalism at the time. Um, very quickly, I'm just going to give you a couple of quotes from, here's one from excuse me, sorry, here's one from Nelson Rockefeller. I'm sorry, this is actually John D. Rockefeller. This is the granddaddy. He's defending his uh, corporate conglomerations. He knows that they're hard on working folk. He knows they run small businesses out. He knows he's gaining great wealth at the expense of the laborers. This is not a secret. And he says, quote, the growth of a large business is merely the, quote, get this, the survival of the fittest. There, he's, excuse me, there is an, not an evil tendency in business, it's mere the outworking of a law of nature. Andrew Carnegie, makes similar claims. And he says, we're marching to perfection is his phrase, as a society. We're weeding out the weak. We're removing the infirm. And it's, the, you know, some people are getting ground out on the teeth of progress, but that's great. Uh, this actually was at the New York um, City Museum in the 1920s, was hanging, uh, 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 obviously, a version of this. But if you, could, if you look closer, you could see the big tree of eugenics. And this is the self-direction of human evolution. So this is taking what Darwin was trying to, what Darwin thought nature's doing, and this is speeding it up. This is putting on steroids, this is making it go faster, and this is guiding it more, more precisely. And he's, you know, if you could look here, you'd see genetics, biology, um, archaeology, mental testing, trait study, um, anthropology, they were doing phrenology. Crazy ideas, if you could, if I study the shape of your skull, I could figure out what kind of character you have. You know, if you've got a, you know, a big forehead, you're certain, you've got certain traits, and if you've got a strong, strong jaw, you've got, you see? If you have a receding chin, you've got to look out for certain things. That, all that stuff gets factored in. And the point is, uh, it goes a couple different directions, but one of the eugenics movements is, uh, one of the parts of the eugenics movement is to strengthen the strong and the others to weed out the weak. So it's positive eugenics and negative eugenics going together. And this is all over the place. This is, uh, you know, better baby contest, fitter family contest. And you do know, if you look at the pictures, it's not hard to figure out who won these. Look at the skin pigmentation and you, you, you don't even need to. Um, Matt, this is a state fair in Kansas. Now, moving along. Guess who gets caught up in this? 
preachers' churches. There is an Oxford University Press book I've got pictured here called Preaching Eugenics, subtitled Religious Leaders and the American Eugenics Movement. And in here, the author, Christine Rosen, chronicles how uh, leaders, and these were almost entirely uh, modernist or liberal social gospelist. They become some of the leaders, the champions of the eugenics movement, including in multiple states, and, and including Wisconsin actually, requiring, they got the state, the state to pass this law and it went through the Wisconsin Supreme Court and held up. They got Wisconsin to pass a law and then it held up, requiring for people to be married that they have to pass a fitness test. And if you were judged to be physically infirm or mentally, the, the, the common phrase was feeble-minded, you then weren't fit to be a breeder. And guess who enforced this? The pastors of these mainline churches. And they would actually make claims like, why is it that we breed Hereford cattle to perfection and then treat, our, treat the human, you know, treat humans like it doesn't matter? This is a movement that went on. Again, we could, we could belabor this point, but I, I would just want you to see the main, the main element. It's that science gets, contemporary science, which now looks at us like, I mean, it's crazy, but it gets weaponized and used in, in and co-opted by and overwhelms Christians. And again, you ask, where was theological anthropology? Third point, and move even more quickly. And this is the issue of science and imperialism. It's not just eugenics at home. It's also during this time a, um, it's also a sense that, a twofold sense. One is a deep fear of immigration. No, not, not, not today, 100 years ago. And it's seriously, deep fear of immigration. And some, I mean, I've seen statements that I really thought could have been lifted off of yesterday's news. Deep fear of being overrun. And here's a, here's a comic, uh, this is from, I think, 1910, where, um, I'm sorry, I got that confused. This is from 1870-something. And you can see that it says, the great fear of the period that Uncle Sam may be swallowed by foreigners. And on the one side, you've got the poor Europeans the European refugees, and you can see it's a refugee. He's got a bag, you know, the, the bag on a stick. And on the other side is the, what they called the yellow scare, the fear that we would be overrun, the U.S. would be overrun by Japanese, Korean, and especially Chinese immigrants. So the U.S. gets involved in, among other things, at this era, the Spanish-American War, 1898, the Boxer Rebellion, 1900, uh, squashing the Philippine insurrection in 1902. Um, and let me, again, share one, just one among many. I'll just keep this quick. One with you. This is from John Barrett. He's the former... Minister to Siam, so the U.S. ambassador to was North Island. Listen to this quote. Now is the critical time when the United States should strain every nerve and bend all her energies to keep well in front of her the mighty struggle that has begun for the supremacy of the Pacific Seas. If we seize this opportunity, we may become leaders forever, but if we are laggards now, we reign laggards until the crack of doom. The rule of the survival of the fittest applies to nations as well as to the animal kingdom. Did you get that? 
The rule of the survival of the fittest applies to nations as well as to the animal kingdom. It is a cruel, relentless principle being exercised in a cruel, relentless competition of mighty forces. And these will trample over us without sympathy or remorse unless we are trained to endure and strong enough to stand the pace. These elements, these elements become stronger and stronger um, and uh, the appeals to science are overt. And it happens in, with respect to imperialism. It happens, as I said, with respect to eugenics. Um, we often, it's easier, convenient, and just natural, I think, for us to tend to think of eugenics as, uh, you know, that's the Nazi thing. It is. But some historians actually think that they, it was exported, largely exported from North America um, to Germany. And it was exported, I mean, there's so many deep ironies here. Um, it's not, I, I, I was picking on liberal Christian, liberal Protestant Christians for supporting the eugenics movement. That's true. It also, though, it did include um, a minority, but it did, it did include some Jewish rabbis who were promoting this as well. And you just think of the, I mean, the cyclical ways these things work. Um, the first international eugenics conference, 1912, included a vice president of the British delegation by the name of Winston Churchill. I'm telling you, these imperialist moves and the eugenics movements and the racism are systemic and deep. And they're all supported by claims to science, every one of them. The U.S. should be expanding its borders and taking over, um, at this era, we took over the Samoan Islands, Hawaiian Islands, um, among, other, among other entities, right? We should expand our reach precisely because it's, it's kill or be killed, it's survival of the fittest. The end of the 19th century in Europe, the Franco-Prussian War broke out. Historians tell us that both sides made overt appeals to Darwin on that. Now, I'm not saying any of this, by the way, to, to dissuade you or persuade you um, for or against the biological account of evolution. That's not my point. That's another topic, okay? That's not my point. My point here is to give us several illustrations. And I tried to pick some that were just far enough away that we have some distance, we can see it. But also tried to pick some that are close enough and similar enough that they don't, you know, they don't sound like they're from the 1300s. The point is, is that we can see how appeals to science so easily get weaponized and exploited for terrible purposes. And we're, we as a culture, I think, are especially prone to this, but even the church, I think, is especially vulnerable to the extent that we don't have a theological anthropology. We don't have an account of humanity that's grounded in our understanding of who God is, what it means to be in God's image, what it means to be created to know God, rede um, redeemed by God, known by God, loved by God, in all of, our, in all of the, the glorious um, differences with which he's made us. Now, thankfully, and I've tried to, I tried to lift up Warfield as a Reformed person and Miley as a Methodist and others, there, we could multiply these. Thankfully, there were many who stood against this. But when you look at this history, you're like, where was everybody at? What were they thinking? And the, the, the lesson I want us to reflect upon is this. Here's what happens when you don't have a theological anthropology. Blown about by every wind of false doctrine. 